So I've been attending the RSA conference as press for the past, I think, four or five years. But this is my first time actually speaking, so I'm really excited to get to share some of uh, what I've learned with all of you. So my presentation is on reaching Gen Z, cybersecurity outreach with viral TikTok and YouTube content. And I'm gonna be going through a little bit of my experience making viral YouTube content, and then some of my more recent experiments into TikTok and some of the major differences between these platforms. Uh, so, disclaimer. Uh, let's start it with who I am. My name is Cody Kinsey. I'm an ethical hacker. I'm a security researcher at Veronis, and I specialize in Wi-Fi and open source intelligence. So I'm the creator of the Nullbyte YouTube channel, as well as the host of the Hack5 channel and Security Forward YouTube channels as well. And I also, in my spare time, design ethical hacking hardware tools that are shaped like a cat. So what is my job? My job is to engage with beginners and make content uh, that teaches ethical hacking accessible to anybody. Uh, and we want to make sure that the next generation of cybersecurity professionals has access to this information as early as possible, and then it's really easy for them to see themselves in cybersecurity roles. Uh, a lot of people ask, why would we bother to make ethical, ethical hacking content for beginners? What is the upside of all of this? Well, for brands or anybody who is a company looking to make this sort of content, um, brand reputation and making sure you're out there making a positive difference in your community is really something that you want to do. Written guides also do not engage younger viewers the way that they used to. And traditional content like you know, news articles or blog posts spread really slowly because some of these SEO processes take a really long time to actually pay dividends and get attention on a really great topic. So Gen Z is also traditionally overlooked by a lot of these advertising techniques. So if you're looking to get your brand in front of Gen Z, you're probably not gonna do it through a technical blog post. And great content also tends to break out of niches and go viral, so all sorts of regular people can see it instead of a very small subset of people who are already interested in cybersecurity. Also, free content makes ethical hacking accessible to just about anyone, and that's a really great way to start gaining talent and getting people who might end up working for your company in the future to know about your brand early on by making their lives easier when they're trying to learn more about ethical hacking or getting into a cybersecurity career. So first off, I'm not the, person, the first person who has made cybersecurity content popular. There's lots of other examples out there. So before we go into what my personal experience has been like creating the Nullbot YouTube channel, let's take a look at some of the other ways that big brands or other people who have set out to create content in the cybersecurity space have done so and what the results have generally been. So the first option, if you have a ton of money, is to make an incredibly high uh, budget, high production quality commercial that stars maybe, I don't know, some of the stars from Mr. Robot, a very popular hacking, uh, show involving hackers that a lot of people really like. Now, this is a great way to get eyes on your content, uh, but weirdly enough, um, while I really, really like this when it first came out, I've noticed that this campaign has been pulled for some reason, I don't know why, and the only versions that you can really find online don't have comments enabled, so also don't know what's up with that. But the problem with this approach is it's very expensive and it does tend to create maybe some expectations that are not fully met. As you can see from this review that says, huge disappointment, I, I tuned in because it features Jonathan Banks. Turns out it's just a heavily produced commercial for printers. Mm -hmm. So uh, obviously if you think that you're watching the next installment of Mr. Robot and it turns out to be a commercial, this is gonna be a little bit of a disappointment. So setting the expectation that this is gonna be like a thriller or, or something like that, and then people tune in and like it all revolves around printers. Let me tell you this, it's extremely difficult to create an exciting narrative that completely revolves around printers. It looks like they did their very best, but after stretching it out to three different intervals, um, I found this to be a very expensive and maybe not necessarily super fruitful way of getting across to people. Um, another approach is tutorial videos. This is pretty straightforward. Uh, it's targeted at beginners. The topics need to be selected carefully because they're pretty hit and miss, and research on these take time. You need to actually set out and find interesting tools, interesting things people are asking about in order to produce content that's topical and doesn't waste time. Technical issues can also sync a production. I cannot tell you how many times I've had a production person drive out an hour to come and shoot with us for a day and then find out that the tool or thing we were working with just does not work. I hate computers because of this, and it is something that you will grow to hate computers too if you make this sort of video content. Um, these can also be seen as guides for criminals. So if you are making content that is too specific, if you're really covering you know, content that is too spicy, it will get taken down, especially if you title it in a way that is not considerate of maybe a total uh, cybersecurity outsider 
looking at the content from the YouTube side of perspective of it getting flagged and deciding that this is too close to a guide for how to basically commit a crime. <clears throat> Another format is news and documentaries. This is covering major industry events. Um, these are high budget, high production quality, um, but these are also very risky for non-news organizations to cover. If you're a big brand and you're trying to start a news show, um, often there's conflicts of interest where maybe your, state, your shareholders don't want you necessarily saying bad things about a particular customer or company, and that can raise issues with whether, whether or not you are actually uh, conflict free when you're reporting this thing. So often in order to create this sort of content, you need to be a news organization. So this is not a very good choice for most non-news outlets. outfits. Um, another format I really like and was very inspired by is the expert topic explainer. So the best example I can think of this is a channel called Computer File. And this is where they have academics or other experts explain concepts with visual aids to make it really, really easy for people asking high traffic beginner questions. Like, what is this? What is that? How does password cracking work? You know, something like that to get access to basically a university professor explaining it to you like you were in their class. This is fantastic, but of course it does rely on having very personable academics who have lots of free time and are willing to sit down and actually do this, which uh, unless you're attached to a university or something is quite difficult to do. Um, this also doesn't need much production quality. It just needs to be about medium with some motion graphics and stuff to keep it moving. So you can be very successful with this format provided you have access to academics or some other talent to, to come on and explain these concepts. Um, and if you want to, again, look for great examples of this, Computer File is probably the best channel I've seen that does this sort of topic. Uh, another is project-based video. So one of my favorite is the Roomba that screams when it bumps into stuff. Um, that is by, uh, oh my gosh, um, Michael Reeves. So another person who I think is actually presenting at this uh, conference is how I hacked a hardware crypto wallet and recovered $2 million. This had, as of uh, the time that I took the screenshot, over four, almost five million views. So these are uh, videos that document a really interesting project. Uh, but the project needs to be shocking, funny, inspirational. It can't just be you know, making a how I made an IoT sensor. Like There's too many other pieces of content out there like that. Um, tapping into trends, with this also t pays off. You can look at what other people are doing that's succeeding and put your own spin on it, and it's a really good way to not have to start from scratch. Now, here's the bad part. Um, it, because this requires so much technical skill, these projects can take an absolute ton of work in order to get off the ground, and they're also impossible to predict. So people self-filming this sort of content so that you can see the whole journey of them uh, doing this is really the best way to do this, because often these projects take unexpected turns and are impossible to script. Another one is Mythbuster style. So this is something that we've been doing on the Hack5 channel, where we try to prove or disprove a popular belief about cybersecurity, hacking, or something like that. These need medium to high production quality. They're expensive and time consuming to film. Um, and the script creation is difficult because we don't know what the outcome is gonna be in some of these cases. We can guess, but we've often been wrong, and that's actually messed up our filming process and cost us extra days, because what we assumed was gonna happen did not actually happen. Uh, topics also have to be very carefully selected, because if you pick something that flops, You've just spent three to four days filming a very time intensive episode that nobody cares about. TikTok and short form content. So um, my friend Serena is a good example of someone who's created some very successful content on TikTok and also uh, kind of paid the price for it because TikTok is a chaotic platform at best um, and is very difficult to make consistent, uh, consistent content on. So the nice thing about TikTok is it's easy to edit. Low production quality is kind of assumed. You can shoot these things from your cell phone and nobody cares. But topics are completely hit and miss. And this is largely driven by the way the algorithm handles your stuff being taken down, which I'll get into in a little bit. But there's also lots of negative comments, outright harassment, like people calling your work and demanding that you be fired because they do not like you. Um, it's difficult to also execute on some of these concepts because when your stuff keeps getting taken down, it's really discouraging to want to make more content. And then also, it's hard to brand these things without ruining it. So introducing brands in a 60-second piece of uh, content is also is often very disruptive and makes the content a lot less fun. So it's very difficult uh, to actually work in brands into some of this content. Live stream. So we were forced to switch to this because of the pandemic. Um, I moved out to Montana at the beginning of the pandemic, and it was no longer possible to film a lot of the stuff that we were doing before. So we switched to fully live live streams. And these can be one of two different styles technical live streams or entertainment live streams like Q&A. So technical live streams are incredibly prone to failure. failure. So imagine um, you know, being in the middle of a, a hundred people watching you do something over your shoulder and then it fails and you have no idea why and you have to figure it out live. It is stressful, unfun, and difficult, but they do tend to perform fairly well. Um, 
They have an extreme technical burden for preparation. It really takes a lot of time to prepare for these. The uh, production investment to make sure everything streams out and doesn't fail is, I would say, about medium, like middle of the road. But it is, it can be difficult to make sure that all the streams go well. Um, Q&A streams are super easy to do, but less popular than the technical ones. I would rather do 100 Q&A streams than one technical stream, though, I'll tell you that, um, after having the embarrassment of being in front of like hundreds of people and having whatever you're working on just not work. So this is all also 100% carried by hosts. If you have someone who's not very charismatic or isn't fun to listen to talk doing uh, like an hour long stream, it becomes exhausting very quickly. All right, so let's talk about the Null Byte channel. This is a channel that got 36 plus million views in just four years making beginner tutorial videos. So the Null Byte channel started out when I was the editor of the Null Byte website. This is a channel, uh, this is a website that has a lot of uh, educational beginner cybersecurity uh, topics that I for a while was a writer, I was then the editor, and then I turned around and asked the management, and I was like, hey, I, I don't think that these are going to do as well as all these videos I see out there covering the same topic, let me try this video stuff. And they said, no, it's gonna be too difficult, too expensive, um, and we don't wanna do it. So I didn't listen at all, and I proceeded to just make two episodes without pay, and I ac actually accidentally created the Nullbyte channel when I was at the DEF CON conference, and I uploaded a video of a pool party while signed into my work account. So that was the very first Nullbyte video, and then after that, I started working with a couple of my friends to create a format that we thought would do better than the other content we saw out there at the time, which mostly, by the way, was just you know how to do this thing and then a, a screen capture with screaming techno music and then just like text over it. So really, there was a pretty low bar at this point in terms of what sort of content was out there, and we wanted to take a look at how other people were doing this, but there was a couple things we really had to look at before we got started. Okay, so when we looked out there and, oh, sorry, I didn't know that the mic was on. Um, when we looked out there and took a look at other content that we thought wasn't doing well, we tried to think, like, how can we create balanced content that doesn't fall into any one of these kind of, like, gray zones that we don't want to be in? So we saw that there were people who were really ethical and would stick just to white hat stuff and had a really good sense of what kind of stuff was illegal or too edgy and would never stray into that territory. We also saw people that were super talented, but maybe not so ethical, and they had lots of raw talent, but they would frequently do stuff that was like too edgy and would get anybody who was sponsoring them in trouble uh, because they didn't have the, the sense to stop at the point that was like maybe illegal or too sketchy. And then we also saw people who were extremely personable, had great personalities, and obviously like attracted people with the way they talked and presented, but maybe didn't either have the, the technical skill or the good sense to stay out of like too troublesome topics. And these sorts of imbalances made content that was kind of like not either not fun to watch or too dry or too frivolous or too awkward or too edgy that we didn't want to fall there. So finding a balance between all of this was probably our biggest challenge when creating a format from scratch and trying to do better than the stuff that was already out there. So the null byte format came about because we needed to do something that we could film at least three per day in an emergency. Maybe somebody's sick, maybe a concept isn't working out, maybe there's some production problem and the SD card is corrupted, formatted, breaks. We lost it one time in a forest. Um, we needed to be able to, in an emergency, film a lot of these all in a row. So if there was any topic or format that was proposed that we could not film three of in a day, we would immediately scrap it because we knew that we couldn't afford to do it at that point. So these were 10 to 15 minute long Cyber Weapons Lab episodes. I came up with the name myself when I was at Pasadena City College and I started doing like talks to the cybersecurity and uh, like computer science community through there. That was the name of the talks that we did and then that kind of carried over to the channel. Um, and we basically took beginner fr uh, friendly topics broke them into four pieces, and this was heavily also inspired by Computer File. While they don't do like tutorial style things, we wanted to take a lot from what they were doing and what was succeeding from them. So a Null Byte episode is broken into four segments. This is the way we always film them. There's the A segment, which is a 15 second topic introduction. The B section, which explains what we're doing and what you need to follow along. The C segment, which people kept calling the C section. Uh, so we'd be in the middle of like a grocery store, and like, hey, you're, you really need to finish your C section. and like. So we, we changed it, so now the C segment um, is a screen capture of all the technical steps, and then the D segment is a wrap up of the topic, and basically where you can find more information about it. And this is very kind of formulaic. We tend to fill them A, D, B, C, because it's just easier to get, kind of get warmed up with the shorter ones, but we could film a lot of these in a day once we got this format kind of figured out. So the original people that started out was myself and my production manager, David Cazarez, uh, a digital production major at CSUN. 
Um, we also had uh, our content contributors, Nick Godshall, Michael Raymond, and Alex Lin, who's over here filming, um, as well as our editor, Eric Sanchez, who helped us produce this. So we really needed a lot of production people in order to do this well. We needed people specifically with a background in production who enjoyed doing it in order to continuously make this format better and not get stuck just producing the same thing over and over. So five months into creating this channel, we had made 10 episodes. Eight of them were paid about $250 each. Um, so this was not a very profitable thing to do. Uh, and two of these we did for free because the company we were working with did, did not think it was worth it to pay us. And they did not want us to do this. They explicitly told us not to do this. Um, so we created a couple episodes. And by RSA in 2018, we had 5,000 subscribers. And our first ever episode was starting to pick up stream. All of a sudden, people were starting to watch and share it. After one year, in April of 2019, we had 750,000 views on that topic. Uh, so that first video that we were not paid to do, 750,000 views, and the channel grew to 169,000 subscribers, largely driven by a couple episodes that were very, very beginner-friendly, beginner things people were searching for, like Wi-Fi hacking, that sort of thing, were really attracting a lot of attention. By year two, we finally had our first big numbers. We hit 1.5 million views on that free episode that we did for no pay. <clears throat> which again, we were told was a bad idea and that we shouldn't do. Um, the channel also hit 500,000 subscribers. And this was at the point where we started to get attention and we also started to get takedowns. So some of our content was being taken down by YouTube and that actually act, acted to amplify us and show us to even more people because there were several news articles about this. Uh, by year three, we were at 715,000 subscribers and the parent company of uh, Wonder, How, Wonder How To, the parent company of Nullbyte, stopped ordering episodes. So they told us they were not gonna pay for any more um, and that we were basically done. And they kind of told us that they were gonna pause this, but it was pretty clear that they were just not going to be buying any more episodes or investing in the, the Nullbyte ecosystem anymore at all. Um, we also moved to rural Montana, which meant that filming episodes became difficult because it took us sometimes a full day to upload something with the connection speed out there. So this pretty much killed the production process for Nullbyte and made it so that we couldn't continue uploading the channel. So if you've looked at the Nullbyte channel, you might see that nothing has been uploaded for about a year, a year and a half, and that's exactly why. So before we get into the current state of Nullbyte, let's talk about what actually really worked with this channel. So our top 10 episodes have about 17 million views. That's about the population of the, of the Netherlands. And again, I was being paid about $250 per episode. So there have been brands out here that have been making content for you know, 10, 13, 12 years that have poured like hundreds of thousands of dollars into their content and have not achieved these sorts of results. So what really worked about this? What's different? Well, okay, a lot of these things are broad topics that apply to basically anyone, and basically anybody could be interested in this, um, that address really simple things. Find information from a phone number using OSINT. Hacking Wi-Fi in seconds. Hunt down social media accounts by username. Um, set up an ethical hacking uh, Kali Linux kit on the Raspberry Pi. These are all things that a lot of people search for because Raspberry Pis are really popular. Kali Linux is really popular. Um, searching for information is really popular. And I find that a lot of these OSINT topics, the ones about researching things, tended to be really, really good for us because so many people cared about it that uh, they tended to be our best performing episodes, even though like they're, they're not strictly super cybersecurity related. They're more, you know, OSINT. They're more OSINT and investigation related, but because they kind of overlap a lot, we found that they tended to be some of our most popular episodes. So let's talk about our worst episodes. Our worst 10 episodes have about 173,000 views. It's about the population of Lancaster, California, which is still not bad, honestly. But these tend to be highly specific. Um, introduction to IPv4 addresses and how to use them. Hot topic, right? Like, what, when do you not want to know about that? Um, access multiple Wi-Fi adapters with AirServe NG. Most people don't know what that topic means or that that, that thumbnail means. Um, so a lot of these are just too specific and they don't really let people know immediately what the video is about. Because they're too niche, they seemed like a good idea at the time and we approved them at the time, but these are some of our worst performing topics of all time. I'll say also, I did a video on using uh, two-factor keys, like hardware keys, and I thought it was gonna be like the best guide on securing yourself against hackers, and it's also some of our worst performing content ever. So I was I was often very surprised by what kinds of stuff didn't hit because I thought I had a great uh, I thought I had a great idea and then it turns out it was too specific like creating fake access points with MicroPython people don't know what that is so that's why a lot of these topics did not do as well as you know hunting down social media names. All right, so let's talk about how to ruin a good idea. These are some hard lessons we learned at Nullbyte. Um, one of them is reading too much off slides or a teleprompter. People can see your eyes moving, it's distracting, people don't like it. 
Another is awkward banter. If you don't have anything to say, then it doesn't work to just vibe and talk for 15 minutes. If you don't have any substance, people really don't like that. Inconsistent content is one of the worst things you can do. If you're putting out five different types of content onto one YouTube channel, people are gonna be so confused about what they're gonna get, they're not going to want to subscribe to you. Bad audio quality will ruin absolutely anything. No matter how good your production is, if people can't clearly hear what's being said, they will not watch it. I cannot stress that enough. Long episodes, anything over 20 minutes is probably gonna be a difficult pitch. People tend to have short attention spans for things like this, especially when the topic is relatively dry. And multi-part series are generally a terrible idea. We see that, uh, for example, uh, how to make this thing, part one, two, three, will have generally perform sort of okay on the first one, we'll have half the views on the second and half the views on the third, and it just goes downhill from there. We try to tell people not to do those because they just don't tend to perform well, and I've almost never seen an exception to this rule. Um, at least when it comes to tutorial style videos. Untested code, if you're about to waste a production person's time filming you working with some code you haven't tested, it's gonna, you're gonna have a bad time. Um, it just, computers are terrible. Uh, and then also irrelevant brand sponsors, yeah, sponsors. If you are repping, for example, like a VPN or something in the middle of something that has nothing to do with that, it, it can be pretty distracting and it can also detract a lot from the value of the content, in my opinion. So where is Mobite today? Uh, aging, out-of-date content that is slowly getting older and older. The parent company has said that they're trying to sell, but I know for a fact that at least two different people have made a very reasonable offer to them and uh, it has not been accepted. So this content could vanish at any time. It's basically four years worth of work that could just vanish. So that's what you get when you're getting $250 per episode and it's all for another brand. Kind of learned our lesson here at the end of the pandemic. Unfortunately, we moved on. So we wanted to take a look at what we could do beyond tutorial videos. We got really, really good at this, but frankly, we needed to learn more if we wanted to continue trying to get closer and closer to a million view videos that break out of the niche of tutorial style stuff where someone's trying to learn how to do a specific skill. We decided to work with the Hack5 channel, which um, in, I think it was actually RSA 2018, um, I cold emailed Darren Kitchen from the Hack5 uh, YouTube channel and told him that I wanted to make content on their channel. They actually host a variety of unique shows on their channel and they've been around since 2005. So because it seemed like the perfect home for our production, we met up with them, uh, talked about what we could do, and then decided to create a new show called Redia, which I think that's, that's what we came up with. Uh, and we took a Mythbusters inspiration from this. We decided that of all the shows that have been teaching people about science who don't really necessarily want to learn about science, Mythbusters was doing an absolutely amazing job. So we took that inspiration and decided to work on a new type of episode that were either testing a hacking myth or misconception, exploring tools that hackers use, or exploring parts of hacker subculture. So our flagship episode, the one we spent the most time and energy on, was defeating facial recognition. We decided to test what real types of, uh, I guess, popular uh, ways of hiding from facial recognition actually work against real face facial recognition software. And we had a microcontroller running fa facial recognition as well as a full-on computer with a uh, Python program running facial recognition to test against two different levels of sophistication. So this took three days of production and filming. We hired a makeup artist. We spent about a week of pre-production research and scripting, and it was our highest production value episode ever. So how did it perform? Well, let's take a look at how one of these episodes performs directly against a tutorial style episode that did really, really well. What's interesting here is, all right, so the facial recognition video had 4.3 million impressions, 195,000 views from impressions, but if you look at the number of comments we got, it was 1,588, or, no, sorry, 58. So these are organic people, like talking about the episode, discussing the episode, asking questions, responding to other people. The other video, which uh, our good friend Nick did uh, on Google dorking and finding information on the internet, on the internet got 9.5 million impressions, 340,000 views, but it only got 451 comments. Not as many people had something to say about that episode. So for us, this episode that got the 4.3 million views did exactly what we were trying to do. It got people to share it, it got people to discuss it and talk about it, and it went much further than any of our tutorial-based episodes had done before. So let's talk about the top episodes that I've done in this last year. We've switched to live streams, and we found that our technical live streams tended to outperform our Q&A streams. We had 74,000 views on from photo to passport number with Multego OSINT. Uh, we had 45,000 on hacking with Parrot Security OS, and Wireshark Basics for Wi-Fi hacking were our best technical live streams. They were also insanely difficult to produce, and I did not enjoy it very much. 
Our Mythbusters-style episodes uh, had 403,000 views for our defeating facial recognition and what Wi-Fi hack, uh, hacking tools do hackers use, where we interviewed hackers at a conference. And then our tutorial episodes, um, how to find anything on the internet with Google dorks and capture Wi-Fi passwords, passwords from smartphones were our best performing technical tutorial content in the last year. So these tend to be things that people either find very intriguing or things that people are really interested in searching for. And we also learned a little bit about how to add brand sponsors without making it terrible. So rather than switching to a commercial about you know, what this you know, software product does, in this case, we had Verona sponsoring a uh, piece of content we did on Hack5. So we decided to go and have some of their best experts do the explanation that you know, typically like the expert would do in Mythbusters. And it was actually kind of a perfect relationship because we got to have some of their best and brightest talent come on, explain this concept, and not do you know, a pitch for the, for the brand. Instead, just show that they're out in the community trying to educate people and do a good thing, which is exactly what we wanted here. So the expert insights really keep the content unbiased, and we don't have to run a commercial because we get the branding on screen, we get the good impression from the vendor. It's honestly a really nice relationship that I prefer so much to some of these like VPN ads or other things that just kind of get forced into content. So all right, let's talk about TikTok. TikTok is the wild west of cybersecurity content, and frankly, it's, a, it's an area that most brands do not want to tread because um, things are wild there. So let's talk about my experience with TikTok. My first episode on TikTok was in 2020, it was on finding Wi-Fi devices by signal strength, and I just used like a whiteboard sketch in order to illustrate the points. It got 47,000 views, 4K likes over a couple months, and I had to edit this twice because TikTok, the app, is terrible for actually editing content, and my phone died. Our second was um, Twitter messages hacker received. We decided to do something that was pure entertainment. There's no technical content here. It's just people sending me weird messages on, on Twitter demanding that I hack someone's account or do something else strange. So I went through and I found the strangest direct messages I'd gotten as a result of being on the Nullbyte channel and answered them. And this was uh, supposed to be part of a series, but the second one got taken down for harassment and bullying, I assume of me, based on the, the comments that I was getting and responding to. But again, I had to edit this twice because my phone died, and it got about 82,000 views and 10,000 likes. Um, this didn't really do too well because it kept getting taken down for harassment and bullying. So I decided to move on and try something, again, a little bit less technical. So we did an episode, What's in a Hacker's Bag? What sort of things do hackers commonly carry in their bag? In this, in this case, we picked a electronic soldering kit, 37,000 views, 4K likes, not taken down for harassment and bullying. So that's an, an improvement over the previous episodes. And I also started using Adobe Premiere Rush, or yeah, Rush in order to edit. If you do TikTok content, I highly recommend it. It is so much better than the app. So we decided to do a defensive one, detect someone hacking your Wi-Fi. This was actually, we were taking content from the YouTube channel, cutting it into shorts, and then releasing it as a bonus piece. It didn't do that well, because again, it was taken down for harassment and bullying. So our attempt to recycle content from the YouTube channel and bring it over to TikTok kind of failed. It did not do too well. Then I decided, all right, I need to do edgy content. Let's try this out. Let's see what happens. What's the worst that could happen? I decided to scale this back a little bit and, and decide to pick everyday situations where somebody might see a cybersecurity problem or flaw and talk about it. So maybe you're at your dentist, maybe you're at your doctor's office, and you notice something like, hmm, that's not right. So I decided I would anonymize this dentist's office so it didn't get taken down for bullying. It was totally anonymous, and I talked about how a flat network or a network that's not segmented could allow people to get into their stuff. This actually did pretty well, but then, again, it was taken down for harassment and bullying. And actually, this one didn't get restored. It was flagged for illegal activities and regulated goods. Um, again, pointing out that, my, that an anonymous dentist office was not properly segmenting their network. So not looking very friendly for cybersecurity topics, especially anything technical. So I was like, this platform is dumb. I'm just going to wing it. Let's just talk about a Dunkin' Donuts that straight up has their cameras publicly exposed to the internet. So in this case, I decided, you know, censoring didn't really work out for me. So let's talk about a specific Dunkin' Donuts in downtown Los Angeles that I had already reported this to. So this had been fixed by 2020. But prior to this, it had been completely possible to watch the private areas in this Dunkin' Donuts through their cameras, which were publicly exposed. This um, obviously is a lot less subtle than the previous version. <clears throat> but. I posted it at 4 a.m. after editing all night. I woke up to hundreds of notifications, thousands of new subscribers, and I was featured on the For You page, and things started getting really crazy. My anxiety started getting worse and worse and worse throughout the day. Um, then I got a call from my work telling me that there was an HR uh, like meeting scheduled because a man had called and demanded I be fired for posting an instructional video on how to hack a McDonald's, which is not a piece of content I've ever made. So let's, let's break this down. 
Um, my edgy video got 4,592 hours of watch time over the course of like 48 hours. Um, I was eventually ruled to have bullied a donut store and my video was taken down. Somebody actually called my work and tried to have me fired over this video. Um, and playing it safe, anonymizing stuff, and being like, you know, like responsible got me 96 hours of watch time before it was taken down. Playing it safe did not work out for me on this platform at all. So, I mean, was the video taken down anyway? Yes, but people's content on TikTok is taken down all the time that has nothing to do with anything that would actually be regulated there. It's a very hostile space for cybersecurity content. And if you pour a lot of time and energy into your episodes, you're gonna have a really hard and frustrating time. So there are lots of other very successful TikTok creators. I've, uh, oh my gosh, I keep doing it. I have a couple uh, listed here just from a quick search on cybersecurity content that has survived being taken down. And if you're in this room and also make TikTok content, I apologize that I didn't put you on here. Um, so one of my favorites is Serena, AKA She Networks. Also, I've noticed uh, Network Chuck, who is on YouTube a lot, also has very successfully transitioned over to TikTok. So if you're looking for examples of other people that have started out in YouTube and then transitioned over to TikTok and have maybe a little bit more staying power than I did after almost you know having the HR meeting about the McDonald's thing, um, check out Network Chuck because he's got a lot of really great crossover content that does quite well on both platforms. So, all right, on the way out, let's talk about how some brands have been doing this. So we can take a look at how companies with huge marketing budgets and huge budgets for content have tried to tackle this and either done, in my opinion, very well, or maybe not so well. So I had to remove the brands from this in order to stay cool with uh, uh, RSA's standards. But um, if you're really curious, I'm sure you could just do a quick search. So let's talk about content creators who got this right, that I think did a really excellent job. So. Uh, the first one is Under the Hoodie. Uh, these are a collection of, series of stories from real pen testers going on real pen testing engagements that actually let you know what it's like to maybe break into a bank or something else really exciting. But there's a really big problem here. And there's a reason why uh, when I was proposing something like this at Verona's, we decided not to do it. So customers, if you are a brand, tend to think you're talking about them even when you're not. And if you tell a really great story that could apply to five different customers and you have permission from one of them to do it, the other four are incredibly likely to think you're talking about them and potentially maybe a little bit litigious. So um, for some reason, the comments are off on, the, on all of these videos. I'm sure it's not related, but we found at least uh, when trying to produce this sort of content from real stories, for example, from incident responders, that this was a very spicy topic because a lot of the time people just assumed it was about them when it was actually not. So mainframe kid and hacker interviews. This is, these are two different brands that have access to really personable role models who either work there or have some other experience that allows people to see what it's like to be a part of this community. I really like these interviews, but it does rely on having access to these very personable role models who are willing to go on camera and do these great kind of very well cut interviews in order to keep things fresh and, and have people be able to see themselves maybe working at this brand. Uh, another one is, and this is more recent, uh, a YouTuber, Mr. Who's the Boss, produced an episode on malicious USB cables that got two million views in five days. If you wanna see a really excellent uh, interview, narrative, and motion graphic piece, like this is one of the best produced YouTube episodes on cybersecurity I've seen in probably a year. It's really, really excellently done, and you can definitely see why this piece of content performs so well. Let's talk about misses. Lots of companies have tons of money to dedicate this, and they do some very strange things with it. Um, so if you're from one of these brands, I don't mean to call you out, I've blurred out your names, uh, but perhaps you could learn from some of the other brands that have done uh, some really innovative and interesting things. The first is Phone on a Drone. This has over six million views, 10 comments, and 62 people liked this video. Um, of the 10 comments, all of them are negative. Uh, so this is one of the worst ratios I've ever seen. Um, basically, this brand put a lot of time and energy getting this content out that said, hey, phones on, drone are, yeah, phones on drones are being used to hack printers. You should go with us. But it didn't really have any information about when this happened, why it happened, a good story. It just threw out a scary fact to six million people to a pretty negative response. Another one is, and this is a trend I see very often, having a completely unrelated industry professional come in and do an interview where they're forced to talk about cybersecurity, but they don't really work in cybersecurity, so they don't have much to say. This is something that a lot of brands do because they think that like, bringing on an outside person from another industry is gonna make like, their company look good, but if they don't let them talk about something fun and exciting from their industry, they end up just making a bunch of metaphors about how like racing is sort of like 
working in a sock or something like that. And it's all very confusing. It's like the worst of both worlds. The sporting people don't like it. The cybersecurity people are confused. Um, I've seen a lot of examples of this that really don't go well. This video looked really expensive to produce, and I was the first comment on this video. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of reasons why I think that these videos don't perform super well, but mixing industry professionals is something that a lot of brands have tried to do, and it generally doesn't work out super great. So this is from the same company that actually did one of my favorite pieces of content. Um, Whiteboard Wednesdays was a great idea. Um, it has generally kind of low production quality, but unfortunately the, what really sunk this is some of the hosts are super uncomfortable and look like they just like don't want to be there at all. Um, they look like they were asked to do this and like they want to go back to their desks. And making someone produce content that they're not com comfortable doing is a great way to reciprocally make your viewer a little bit uncomfortable. I will also note that for accessibility and interaction, comments are off on this entire series and most of the subtitles are in Italian. So if you were like a deaf person or were trying to watch this on your phone and maybe not be able to turn up the volume all the way, it would basically be impossible. So some notes on that. Um, and then my final piece of content, um, this is a very famous cybersecurity con uh, company and this is their most seen piece of content. They decided to do an ad that explains how vulnerable you are by having a naked, a pixelated naked lady um, and for some reason the comments are off, possibly because they're like incredibly toxic, who knows? Um, but I would not have done this, um, is all I will say about this piece of content. So uh, this is one of, I think, the worst things you can do to a successful channel. If you don't have a specific department that has ownership of a channel and you're producing both excellent shows uh, that engage people and interest them and then random marketing content like this. Um, this piece of content got 109 views on a channel that had 17,000 subscribers. Is it really worth 109 views to alienate your 17,000 subscribers that subscribe because you were producing like a great show? Probably not, in my opinion. So, all right, what are some takeaways from my experience making this content and trying to make cybersecurity accessible through video? Um, for one, InfoSec content doesn't need to be dry or boring. There's absolutely no reason for it to be dry and boring. Um, authentic, useful, and balanced content spreads a lot more rapidly than any marketing content will. So if you find people that already have something to say, they're already producing successful content and find ways of sponsoring them, supporting them, this is a much better way than trying to reinvent everything yourself. Gen Z learns about cybersecurity careers through social media. They do not learn about it through a lot of the traditional ways you would expect, through school even. A lot of the people I talk to get into cybersecurity careers because of the tutorials they find online and get access to early in their career. And another thing I've learned is amplifying non-traditional creators helps attract diverse talent. If you're looking to attract people to your company who are diverse, you should be amplifying and finding people out there who are already creating content that maybe don't have all the right sponsors or all the right resources and help them by you know, supporting them and making sure that they have access to the resources they need to make great content. It's really the best thing you can do is support people that are already passionate about what they're doing and already making great content. And uh, that's all I've got. Thank you very much.